Wow, Thanksgiving is a time to remember that God is good all the time. And all the time, amen. Some of you may not know that uh, I was gone. <laughs> but I was unbelievably blessed. I, I unbelievably blessed uh, to be invited by Governor Mike Huckabee and his wife Janet to take a journey with a hundred other people, most of whom were pastors from various parts of the country. And we first flew to Krakow, Poland, where we saw the the birthplace and some of the events and places surrounding Pope Paul John II, how his faith inspired the faith of his uh, Polish homeland. Did you know he was the first non-Italian pope selected in 450 years? And it was as a result of his faith and how he inspired the faith of the Polish people that helped bring down communism in Eastern Europe. We also, while we were there, visited the uh, concentration camps, the Nazi concentration camps in Auschwitz and Birkenau. And we flew to London. We saw the war room of Sir Winston Churchill. It had been covered up for 40 years, and it was underground where they made their decisions during World War II and visited the, the factory. You probably saw, some of you saw uh, the, the movie Schindler's List, and we visited that particular factory. Went to the parliament, we heard speakers talk about the faith of Margaret Thatcher. And we flew to California, visited the Reagan, uh, Reagan Presidential Library. Ten days, eight takeoffs and eight landings. 15,000 miles, eight different time zones. I'm going to conclude the sermon because I'm tired and I've got to get home. <laughs> that, that's it. That's all I could come up with. <laughs> well, listen, I hope you see it as a blessing because I've got a lot of illustration material over the next few weeks, okay? One of the most notable religious buildings in all of the United Kingdom is Westminster Abbey. It's been the traditional site for the coronation of kings and queens there in Great Britain for centuries, I mean centuries, as well as the burial site and and place where they had many funerals of the uh, British monarchs. Construction of this present building began in 1245. Can you wrap your arms around 1245? That's a long time ago. One of Great Britain's highest honors is to be buried or commemorated in Westminster Abbey. Over 3,000 individuals are either buried here or have a commemorative plaque on the floor or on the walls, including famous poets and military generals and scientists and doctors and, and politicians. And some of the people that we might have heard of include uh, Sir Isaac Newton and Uh, Prime Minister William Pitt and William Wilberforce and Charles Dickens and Alfred Lord Tennyson and Sir Winston Churchill and and even uh, United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt. But as we first entered the front, uh, or the nave, they call it, of the Abbey, the guide said the one person who is most revered out of all of those 3,000 people in Westminster Abbey, the one person whose plaque no one is allowed to walk on, The one person whose grave they decorate inside Westminster Abbey is that of someone whose name they don't know. It is here the remains of the unknown warrior are buried. He was an unidentified British soldier killed on the European battlefield during World War I. And he is a symbol for all of the brave warriors who gave their lives in military combat for Great Britain over the centuries. I hope you've had a chance to read through uh, the Bible assigned scriptures this past week because in today's text, the Apostle Paul is ministering in the metropolitan city of Athens. Here in Athens, hired slaves performed much of the work so their owners could devote themselves to study and debating the latest topics of the day. And on one of his many walks through the city, Paul notices an unusually large number of idols throughout the city. I mean, they even had in Athens a monument to an unknown god, just in case they forgot one. And Paul seizes upon the existence of this altar 
to preach to the Athenian people the identity of this one true God. I don't need to tell you, these are difficult times we are living in. Unbelieving people today wish to impose their secular and atheistic views and lifestyles upon societies all around the world. And I'm telling you, Paul's message here to the Athenians is one that we need in our world today. So, Acts chapter 17, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way, for as I was walking along I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm going to tell you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since He is Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve His needs, for He has no needs. He Himself gives life and breath to everything, and He satisfies every need. From one man, He created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when those nations should rise and fall, and He determined their boundaries. His purpose was so the nations would seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward God and find Him, though He really is not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and we move and we exist. As some of you, your own poets have said, we are His offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now God commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to Him. For He has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man He has appointed. And He proved to everyone who this man is by raising Him from the dead. All right, take out the outlines there on the inside of your bulletin. Before we really get into the meat of Paul's sermon, I want to look at what our world is like without God. Athens had been the political and cultural center and capital of the world, the entire world. By Paul's day, the Romans had devastated a good portion of the city, and its population, when Paul was there, probably hovered around 20,000 inhabitants. Now, there was a huge hill that rose above the city upon which there were temples and sacred buildings that were dedicated to the many pagan gods. And scattered throughout the city were more than 3,000 statues to these pagan idols. It is said that in the first century there were more of these statues and idols in Athens than existed throughout the rest of Greece combined. And so as Paul is there in Athens and he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to join him, he embarks upon many walks through the city, surveying the physical beauty of the city, the uh, moral condition, the spiritual climate. You ever been in a foreign city and you've taken a walk and you're not really sure where you're going, you hope you get back? You don't know anybody there? I still remember walking down Bourbon Street in New Orleans with Jane and her parents when we were yet in high school. Forty years ago, it was New Year's Day morning, the morning after, all right? And and consequently, it was really quiet. But even when it was quiet, I'm telling you, there was more than this teenage boy from Wayne, Nebraska, had ever seen before. And I suspect that's kind of what Paul saw as he was walking around Athens, and he saw the spiritual climate 
and corruption. He observed a morally bankrupt society, a, a lazy people who were inclined to more talk about life than they were to actually engage in living and working. And everywhere Paul turned, there was an idol to some god. Imagine, if you will, you know, prior to an election, when you see all the political signs up in the city and in the countryside, imagine if every one of those political signs was instead an idol made of stone or wood or a monument to, to Buddha or Joseph Smith or an animal or some other object or god. That's what Paul saw. That's what the people of Athens lived with on a daily basis. And they thought they were sophisticated. They thought they were um, intellectually and spiritually superior to the other cities of their day. But in fact, they were devoid of truth. They were devoid of intelligence. They were devoid of righteousness. Know this, God has placed a desire within each and every human being to know Him. He put it there. But instead of seeking after the one true creator of every living thing, people all too often worship idols they've made for themselves. In Paul's time, those idols were, as I said, wood and stone made to specific gods. Today, our idols can be a material object like a house or a car. Or our idols can be uh, an activity watching sports or participating in sports or listening to music or, or uh, gaming on television or, or computer or Xbox or watching television or watching movies, anything that dominates our time, anything that we find ourselves basically uh, worshiping. Our, our object, our idol can be something immaterial like a job or pleasing our flesh. And while God promises to reward every person who seeks after Him, God promises that if we search after Him, He will help us to find Him. He also allows people the free will to do whatever shameful things that we want to do, that any shameful things that our hearts desire for us to do. In other words, if we want to mess up our lives, and God knows I've done that many times. He permits us to do so. Unfortunately, many of those who have abandoned God aren't content to just sin themselves. Oftentimes, they feel the need to encourage and help others to join them in their evil as well. Charles Manson is an example of what happens when an individual abandons God. In the 1960s, Manson recruited and brainwashed a, a number of people to promote violence and theft and murder in, a, in what he called helter-skelter. They were called the Manson family. He was convicted in 1971 of seven murders. Even though he didn't commit them, he had, he had convinced the members of his family to commit those seven murders. And today, Charles Manson is 80 years old, serving a lifetime prison sentence, but he continues to be an example of what happens, the violence and the insanity that can occur in an individual when we abandon God. Bourbon Street, as I mentioned in New Orleans, is an example of what happens when a city begins to abandon God. Another example is San Francisco. For many years, you could walk around nude in San Francisco and it wasn't against the law. And so, if I'm walking down the streets of San Francisco with my kids, and somebody's walking down the street nude, I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't do anything to protect my kids. There was no legal authority that I had to do anything until November of 2012. When I, I guess the Board of Supervisors 
finally had enough, and they developed an ordinance banning public nudity. Now, what's interesting is that that ordinance only passed six to five. Now, while the idea to many of us, hopefully most, if not all of us, of walking around nude is, is offensive, it is so because of the way we were raised by our parents and, and the way biblical truths have impacted our lives and our parents' lives and our society as well. But listen to me. If, if in fact, we are nothing more than animals, if, in fact, we are nothing more than animals that have evolved over billions and billions of years, and if, in fact, we are not the creation of a, a, a divine creator who has put us here to bring glory unto himself, if all of that's true, then there really isn't any secular argument for why we shouldn't walk around publicly in the nude. Nazi Germany is an example of what happens when a nation begins to abandon God. Upwards of 11 million people were exterminated by the Nazis during World War II, six million of whom were Jews. I was there. There's something sobering about standing in the place where people were herded into what they thought were showers and instead were poisoned and slaughtered. And you ask yourself, how can an entire nation of people do very little to stop what was going on? How could that happen? Yes, the Nazis lied to the German people about the Jews and, and, and what the Jews were like, and, and they lied to the German people about what was happening to the Jews. I understand that, but listen. People knew. People had suspicions. And yet they chose to look the other way and do nothing. How is it that people in the United States permit the mass slaughter of unborn human life and we do little about it? I understand. We've been lied to about what abortion is. We've been lied to about how prevalent abortion is is we've been lied to about the purpose of it i understand that but we still suspicion the truth and yet we choose to look the other way and do nothing this is what happens when an individual and a city and a nation abandon god and solomon writes the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge only fools despise wisdom and discipline. Fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's the start of knowledge. God said through the prophet Hosea that people are destroyed when they don't know Him. In other words, there can be no wisdom where there is no God. There can be no beauty where there is no God. There can be no morals where there is no God. There can be no peace where there is no God. There can be no happiness where there is no God. Who or what determines the value of marriage, morality, and decency, and law? Who decides those things if there is no God? Well, we do. And I personally saw firsthand what happens when human beings decide what is right, what is wrong. It was not a secular society the founders of this nation wanted. It was not a secular society the founders of this nation developed. And it was not a secular society the founders of this nation left us. And yet, it is a secular society devoid of God, absent of God, that we are increasingly getting today. And we need to understand there are consequences to living in a secular society, and I've yet to see one good consequence of living in a secular society yet. Secondly, our world is God's. 
So here we are in Acts chapter 17. Paul is standing in the midst of supposedly learned, undeniably secular city leaders. And Paul says, and I just kind of summarize here if I can. He says in his sermon to the people there, I noticed on my many walks that there are lots of idols throughout this city. In fact, Paul said, I, I noticed there was even a monument to an unknown God. Well, this God whom you do not know has brought me here to tell you about Him. And here's what I want to tell you. He is the Creator of everything we can see. He is the Lord, Paul said, over everything we can see and over everything that we can't see. He doesn't need us, but we need Him. He determines which nations rise and fall and where and when they rise and fall. This God wants us to know Him because we wouldn't be here without Him. And we can't continue to exist without Him. Paul said we have no meaning apart from God. And this God has overlooked our ignorance. He has overlooked our stubbornness in the past. But the time is coming, Paul said, when God is going to judge the world. And we need to be prepared for it. And our text tells us that some of the people who were listening to Paul's sermon laughed. Some of the people scoffed. Guy's nuts. But it also tells us some wanted to hear more. Some began to believe in the God that Paul spoke about. What Paul shared with those secular leaders in Athens some 2,000 years ago is a message that the secular people around us need to hear today 2,000 years later. And it is you and I that God has appointed to tell them. We need to tell them what Paul told the people of Athens. And when we do, when we share with them these truths, some are going to scoff. Some are going to laugh. Some are going to say, you're nuts, and you don't know what you're talking about. But the reality is, some are going to listen. Some are going to hear. And to those who believe, we will be the instrument through which our Lord brings them eternal salvation. In one of His final prayers here on earth, Jesus said to His heavenly Father, this is the way to have eternal life. These are not my words. These are Jesus' words. To know you, you, the only, I didn't say this, he did, Jesus did, the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ whom you have sent to earth. Now listen, Jesus did not say in that prayer that eternal life was given to everyone regardless of whether they believe in God or not. And Jesus did not say in that prayer that eternal life was giving, given to everyone who has a belief in any God. Neither did Jesus say that eternal life was given to someone who has a nominal, unemotional attachment to God. There's one God. And there is one way to God. And it is through Jesus Christ. And there is one way to respond to this one God. And that is to deeply and intimately and emotionally and passionately know Him. Which is what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3. Paul said everything. Let me emphasize that. Everything else in life is worthless compared to the invaluable, immeasurable, surpassing gain of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord. All my attention, all my time, all my focus, all my energies are devoted to knowing Jesus Christ because when I really know Jesus Christ, I will experience, I will witness God's unbelievable power at work in me and through me and around me. That same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And Paul said, eventually, I want to experience 
the same resurrection from the dead that Jesus did. And I would add my hearty amen to that as well. This is God's world. It's not ours. Jesus taught us to pray, God's kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When God wanted to part the Red Sea, He did it. When God wanted to calm the stormy sea, He did it. This is God's world. We choose whether we want a secular, atheistic worldview and corresponding lifestyle or whether we want a sacred, God-centered worldview and the corresponding lifestyle. Not only do we make the choice, but we reap the consequences of that choice. So I'm going to ask you, which is it going to be? On the journey, by the way, you can just Google it. Mike Huckabee, the journey. But on the, on the trip, I visited with a Christian brother who, who ministers in Las Vegas, Nevada, Sin City, where you've heard the marketing slogan, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. In other words... Do whatever you want to do while you're here. Whatever you want. And no one at home ever needs to know. It's the way they market the city. Not only is gambling legal in Las Vegas, but so is prostitution. And while we might think, wow, that's got to be difficult ministering in a city like that, the truth of the matter is God is able to accomplish good and do good wherever. Godly people want to minister in, in His name. So this church, huge church, has a lot of prayer groups and a lot of ministries that are devoted to these various problem areas. They've got a, a group of people that pray for the prostitutes in that community and area, and they have a ministry to them as well. It's cool to listen to the things that they do to try and share this good news with these prostitutes. They have a, a group of people that pray for prisoners, and they have a ministry uh, called their re-entry ministry that is devoted to helping individuals who have been in jail and now been released adjust back into um, uh, life on the outside of, of the jail. And what was interesting to me is that this church receives the names of prisoners who've been released from jail from the police department. Seriously, yeah. For 15 years, their prayer group was play, praying for the police department. 15 years. And after 15 years of praying for the police department, the law enforcement officials come to the church with a request. Could you help us out? Fifteen years of praying. Could you help us out? Here is what they said. We cannot arrest our way out of the crime problems we have. Well, that's true in all of America. You can't build enough jails to fix the problem. In the five years since this partnership began between law enforcement and the church, the law enforcement has seen the success rate the church has, or you and I know it's Jesus has, in changing lives, and the police department makes no apologies whatsoever with the partnership they have with the faith community because God's ways work. Always. When Pope John Paul II visited his homeland of Poland in June of 1979, and I stood there where two and a half million people gathered. He reminded the Polish people that their identity and their humanity could only be found through Jesus Christ. It's reported a young man approached the Pope with this question. Why doesn't the church, and, and many ask the same question today, why doesn't the church loosen up its standards on morality, on birth control, on abortion, on, on marriage and divorce? And here was his answer. My son, the church is the standard.
We don't have to relax our biblical standards so that we can appeal to a broader audience. We don't have to compromise our beliefs so that we can be more relevant in the world's eyes. The fact of the matter is the world's standards don't work. God's standards do. The world doesn't have the truth. God is the truth. The world is lost in trying to find its way, and God is the way. It is not the responsibility of the church of Jesus Christ to conform to the world. Paul made it very clear in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. It is the role of the world to conform to the person of Jesus Christ. So on Thursday night, Mike Huckabee is speaking to a crowd in the Reagan Presidential Library, eight to 900 people. And he said, and I quote, America doesn't need better politics so it can have better religion. Sometimes we think that we've got to have the right people in office so that things will be better here for the rest of us. America does not need better politics so it can have better religion. America needs better religion. And he said, when it has better religion, the better politics will follow. In 1987, President Ronald Reagan went to Berlin and he stood at the Brandenburg Gate there that divided East Berlin from West Berlin. Communism East Berlin from Free West Berlin. And he made that famous statement that we're probably all familiar with. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And only two years later, it came down. But President Reagan said something else that our secular media did not report upon, which is not a surprise. He described a radio tower built there by the communist East German regime at East Berlin during the 1960s. And this radio tower was built there uh, purposely right next to the church with the tallest steeple. Because the communists wanted to make a statement. See how much bigger it is than the church steeple? But it wasn't until after the radio tower communicating communist propaganda was built that a serious flaw was discovered. I don't know if you can see it there or not. Whenever the sun hit the globe on the radio tower, it reflected a, a large, undeniable cross. And the communists tried to paint over the globe. They tried to sandblast the globe. They even used acid on the globe. But nothing worked. And Reagan concluded, and I quote, Yet even today, when the sun strikes that sphere, the sphere that towers over all of Berlin, the light makes the sign of the cross. There even in Berlin, symbols of love and symbols of worship cannot be suppressed. Brothers and sisters, the world may laugh at the truth, and the world may scoff at the truth. And the world may say that those who bear the truth are crazy. And the world will oftentimes even try to suppress the truth. But the truth of Jesus Christ cannot and it will not forever be kept a secret. Better government. Better families. Better society. Better marriages. Begin with better Religion. And better religion begins when you and I have a deeper, closer, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So what's it going to be? When anybody else around you chooses to do, that's their business. What are you going to choose to do? Because the better we know Jesus 
the better equipped we are to share Jesus 